Well, good day. Now we're going to start with part two of our basic forensic digital analysis and investigation. Again, I'm your speaker for this module, Dr. Dennis S. Lagumen, Dean of the College of Criminology and Criminal Justice of Kalayan Educational Foundation Incorporated. So in part one, just to recap our discussion, we have learned how the computer saves and deletes files. We learned also how we are going to carve deleted files. We also learned about file signature. So these are important, uh, important in doing digital forensic analysis. Now in part two, we're going to talk about cybercrime investigation, what we're going to do at the search scene, and how are we going to do basic digital forensic analysis with documenting the scene. So we call it the scene and not the crime scene simply because um, we're looking for digital evidence. And according to our uh, expert, uh, Mr. Obi Carroll, the proper term for that is the scene. So we will use the term the scene. So let's say, for example, you were included in a, in a team of police officers to conduct and to serve a search warrant against a suspected drug personality, meaning those that peddles drugs or a drug lord. So they invited you as a digital investigator because they believe that there might be digital device that needs to be preserved and that can be used to convict the person or the suspected drug lord beyond reasonable doubt. So your primary purpose is, in the, preser is the preservation of digital evidence. So let's say, for example, they serve the warrant and when they are searching the house, when they open one room, you see this. This is the scene that you see upon opening the door. So probably you would say, oh, what is happening here? So it is obvious from the computer that there is a porno site, probably a child pornographic site, or they are selling children for online sexual exploitation. We can see that there is a mobile phone, money, credit cards, and the like. So these are potential digital evidence. So how are you going to conduct and preserve the digital so if we're going to go back in our traditional crime scene investigation we know that if there are no injured person the number one action should be the preservation of the area this is for putting up a core a police line so that no unauthorized person can contaminate the area okay so after the preservation of the area we have to follow the golden rules of crime scene investigation and i think all of us all of you are familiar with the golden, uh, golden rules of crimes and investigation. And this is, not, this is, do not move or touch anything unless it is properly photographed and sketched. So after you have conducted, after you have uh, recorded, photographed the crime scene or the search scene, now you're going to do a search. And in a search, you normally do have a search plan. You can either use the traditional search plan method. We have the strip method. We have the double strip method. We have the grid method. And we have the concentric or the wheel method. So whatever search plan you use or method, okay, the, the basic rule is you have to preserve digital evidence since you are the digital forensic investigator. So it's your ability to recognize, collect, and preserve this digital evidence that would make the difference in proving the guilt of the person beyond reasonable doubt. And after you have done this, let's say, for example, you have already preserved the scene and now you are ready to do a search of the area. Now, let's say, for example, you use the strip method. So what are you going to, what possible digital devices would you collect? So normally, Number one and the most obvious is the laptop. Now, collecting the laptop, it depends on whether it is powered on or powered off, but we will discuss that later on. Then there is the mobile phone. What else? What else did you see from here, from this uh, scene? There is the, what's number three? That is, what's that? It is a router. What else? We have the external drive. What else? Credit card. This could help us to identify that the uh, person who owns the computer. This, uh, of course, the money. 
Then we have this CD that contains maybe contains information. And we have the a flash drive. And beside the flash drive is a phone that we can also use to get the IP address of the telecommunication device. So all of these are potential digital uh, devices that contains digital evidence that you must collect properly. But then again, the proper collection is important so that we can ensure the protection of the probative value of all digital evidence. And how could you ensure the protection of the probative value of the physical of the digital evidence? How? Well, you have to record all evidence collected, just like in a traditional uh, crime scene search. And you must maintain a chain of custody. And in order to ensure this, okay, then sure, normally the form must be signed by witnesses, meaning the investigators and the witnesses who are present during the search in the serving of the search warrant. So this was a form that was uh, given to us by the PNP and the cyber, uh, PNP anti cyber crime group. Okay, so this is one of the forms that they use. Okay, digital forensic laboratory evidence custody form. So it tells here the lab case with the officer requesting the investigation, agency, contact of uh, officer, investigator, the agency case, nature of the crime, contact, and you're going to put here, itemize here, all the digital device that you recovered from the search scene. Then normally you have to do the uh, customary signature. So this would act as your chain of custody so that to ensure that the digital device collected at the scene are authentic. But aside from that, later on in our discussion, we will so also discuss another way of ensuring the authenticity of the digital evidence or the digital device. So, I ask you, let's say, for example, in the search scene, you encounter a computer that is powered off. Okay? In order to collect this properly, what should you do? Should you open it and check whether it has any incriminating evidence or you just bring it to the laboratory? Well, according to Obi Carroll, the best way in order to preserve the property value of a powered off computer what? Well, Sure, of course, it's bad, tag, bad transport to the computer laboratory because simply because as a forensic investigators, you do not have, um, it is best pra exa examined in a computer laboratory with the necessary uh, digital uh, devices, forensic toolkit that can be used. And at the same time, although there is a computer, when you conducted a search scene, it doesn't mean that the computer is used for criminal activities simply because it's powered off. And you don't have the uh, authority to open and analyze the computer data. If you would remember your, uh, your module in cyber warrants, you need a warrant to examine computer data. If not, and if you examine a computer without having a warrant, any evidence collected from that computer might be inadmissible in evidence. So therefore, if the computer is powered on, tag bag transport to the computer laboratory, secure a warrant to examine computer data, and that's the time that you can open the computer. Okay? So when you're going to tag bag the, and transport the computer laboratory, it's best that you record the details of the laptop or the computer. So you have to copy the product number, and the serial number. So this would ensure that the computer will not be changed, okay? Or replaced by any scrupulous people. So going back to our search scene, okay? What should you do if the computer, the laptop is powered on? For example, as can be seen in the picture, when you open the door, there is an online sexual exploitation of children. Meaning there are, let's say for example, there are child pornography being shared via computer. So how are you going to collect a computer that is powered on? What is the proper procedure? So that the, any information in the computer can be used in court in order to prove the guilt of the person beyond reasonable doubt. So would you turn up the computer? Okay. 
would be this the would be this uh, would be this the correct uh, uh, action if the computer is powered on turn it off well according to mr carol obi carol no you never turn off a powered on computer why by turning off the computer there are many datas that would be lost especially the datas in ram now i think you, un you understand what is ram it is random access memory okay now for any device to function properly all the data must go through ram okay and that's why when you're going to buy a smartphone you look for a smartphone that has a big ram if it is a one ram cell phone you don't like to buy that it's too slow you need around three four two four or six ram simply because the more ram you have the faster it can process the data and the faster the computer would function so you don't turn off the computer because you lose the valuable information in ram and ram are temporary memory once the power is off this data in ram are are deleted meaning they are not saved so therefore turning off this computer laptop would destroy this data in ram so you don't pull the plug let's say for example if it is a desktop you don't pull the plug again because it's similar to turning it off so therefore it's not good or since it's powered on would you look for incriminating evidence in the computer see what are the websites that they visited probably they have email open you would like to read the email or the Facebook is open, you would like to see what are the chats, the content of the chat? Well, according to Obi Carroll, no. Don't do this. Because like I said, you have search warrant, but you don't have a warrant to examine computer data. Okay? So in order to um, ensure that the computer data can be used in court, you must first secure a warrant to examine computer data before conducting any digital, digital forensic analysis on the computer. So therefore, do not move the mouse, do not scroll on the file explorer whatsoever, do not touch the computer. Okay. So, what are the basis for this concept? Well, even in the PNP anti-cybercrime uh, policy or manual, there is this procedure process in paragraph C and D. Do not start up equipment that is switched off. So therefore, if it is powered off, do not turn it on. Let the digital investigators conduct the investigation at the laboratory. And switch off equipment that is running only when you have made sure that this is appropriate. So therefore, turning off the equipment should be only done if you believe it is already appropriate. A document that is open and visible, for example, may be encrypted when stored. And that's true. Let's say, for example, my files is password protected. When you turn it off and you turn it on, the computer will ask you my password. And you cannot force me to give you your password. Okay? So, as we can see from the POP, okay? Procedure uh, POP manual, okay? Police Operational Procedure, Manual 2013. In paragraph B, secure the computer as evidence. What do you need to do? If the computer is off, do not turn it on. If the computer is on, do not turn it off. Nor touch its mouse or its keyboard because you might enter a new data and that could contaminate the digital evidence. So from here, you can see in the manual of the PNP, do not turn off any powered on computer so in order to collect a powered on computer you had to follow the three steps of incident response that was taught to us by obi caro so what are these three steps of incident response so these three steps are one let's first talk about the step one which is image ram i think you remember our discussion of what is ram random access memory 
Here, the computer process everything that you are doing with the computer, but then again, it is not saved. It is only when you click save that the information in RAM would be saved in the hard drive. But as long as you're not clicking save, the data in RAM are only temporary and cutting the power of the computer, you would lose all the information in RAM. So the first thing you have to do before you turn up the computer is image the RAM. Okay. So like the other RAM. You would remember a computer has two memory the hard drive which is rom random uh, uh run, read only memory and the ram which is access, uh, a random access memory so like i said everything that you do in a computer is in ram if there is a virus in your computer it will be in ram okay if you type any documents if you open a movie if you open a, a browser you open your facebook your in twitter instagram all of those information are in ram so therefore, we have to ensure that we get the data in RAM. And how are you going to get the data in RAM? By imaging RAM. Okay. So everything you do in your computer passes through RAM. So that's why that's how important RAM is. Your computer has a 16 GB RAM. So it has a lot of data. So we have to preserve that. Okay. So whatever you do in your computer, let's say for example, like I said, your computer has a virus, a malware, it will be in RAM. You open any document, it's in RAM. You run a scan, a virus scan in your computer, it will be in RAM. You open, you open any browser, it is in RAM. You connect to a Wi-Fi, it's in RAM. You check the settings of your computer, it is in RAM. You made the chat, it's in RAM. Or whatever you do in the computer, it always passes to RAM. So all of this information is in RAM. And by turning off, you lose all of this information. So that's why we have to image RAM. Now you may ask, what do you mean by image RAM? Well, in simple terms, when you say image RAM, we're going to make a copy. But not just a copy, the, the traditional sense. You're going to copy bit by bit the content of RAM. When you say bit by bit, every part of the, the RAM will be copied as if you're going to clone the RAM. So once you image the RAM, it becomes a forensic image now. Okay? So RAM has valuable data. Okay? So how are we going to image RAM? Okay? So according to Obi, when they conduct in... Uh, training to their law local law enforcement officers, they normally gave them a 128GB flash drive. And in the 128GB flash drive, it contains a folder. They call it the live response folder. And in the uh, live response folder, it, there are several software that can be used to image RAM. Okay? So when you open the live response tool, you would see several uh, software. Now, what the software that I'm going to show here are open software, meaning they are free, but there are the paid version. So, what there are, what the crime laboratories would be using the crime, uh, the paid version. But for our training, we're just going to use the open, uh, open software, meaning free. You can download this even in the internet. We have the FTK Imager, okay. We have uh, Magnet Action, we have EDD, dump it. And Belka Soap RAM Capture. So all of these, uh, especially this one, this one, and this one, are used to capture or image RAM. Let's say, for example, you're going to use FTK Imager. Now, what do you mean by FTK? It stands for Forensic Toolkit. Now, when you open FTK, you would see a dialog box here. Okay? And this is your main uh, screen for FTK. Now, since you're going to capture memory, you need to click this icon. Okay, let me uh, let's enlarge that. So this is the icon. Okay, so it says capture memory, and you see the the draw uh, the the image is similar to a RAM. Okay, so when you click memory, okay, capture memory, a dialog box will appear. 
or if you would like to you can press file and just choose capture memory click that a dialog box would come out so capture memory memory capture it's going to ask you first where do you is the destination path the destination path is where you're going to save the image the image of the ram so you click browse and this will come out and normally if you're going to image the ram of a suspected uh, sus uh, of a criminal you're going to save the image ram to your external drive you don't save it to the computer of the suspect you save it in your external drive but for our training we will just save it in our desktop this is for training for processor huh? in actual case you save it in an external drive so for training we'll save it in desktop okay you could use the live response folder to where you're going to save it and if you want you can make a new folder and you click that you can let's say for example name it ram okay and now so you would see here the destination path is at c drive user training desktop live response ram image now the default name would be memdump or memory dump okay now after that click capture memory after you click capture memory a dialog box a progress dialog box would come out and you would see the progress here so from here the 32 percent already captured and once it is finished you would see here memory captured finished successfully now you can click close now another software that can be used to image ram is dump it okay ram capture now when you click this icon dump it uh, icon for example this one okay it would appear like this and anybody who is familiar with this image so this is the dos command okay so sometimes people are more uh, familiar with using the DOS, so they would choose dump it. But some people would not rather not use the DOS command, so they can use the FTK imager. So in the dump it, it is more of a DOS command, and you're going to be asked, are you sure you want to continue capturing imaging this? Okay, you just click yes if uh, you want to capture it. Click no if you don't want to capture it. So just click Y and it would process see click y and it tells you if it is already finished now another way in which you can capture ram is using magnet action however this is a paid version okay so this paid version has no open software so therefore we cannot use this but obi carol was kind enough to give us this cup so when you use magnet action all the data in RAM, it would process it. Okay, it would categorize all data. It would categorize cloud server URLs, Facebook, Google Analytics, Google Map, Google Searches, Google Translate, identifiers, malware, parse search query, social media. It has chat, email, web-related, peer-to-peer media. So therefore, all the data in RAM would be categorized among these um, categories. Okay, so let's you click google searches okay so what can we see from google searches for example staging accidental death now why would you like to search in google how you're going to stage an accidental death let's say for example you're investigating a person whose wife fall from a stairs and now he is collecting an insurance and when you examine the computer, you see in a Google search, staging accidental death. What does that mean? Hmm. So, sounds suspicious, right? Or let's say, for example, Power Batch changed file name. You have seen in his Google search how to change file name of PowerShell, meaning these are data in the computer. Why would you like to change that? So, this gives an idea that the person is trying to hide something or research scientist job okay or the highlighted one secretly copy files from computer to usb drive now why do you would like to search that you are able to secretly copy data 
to a USB drive. You only do that if you would like to hide something. So from here, let's say for example you have seen a search here and you've seen that there are no imp uh, incriminating data in the computer, maybe it's already transferred to a USB drive. So this gives you an idea on what to look for is in order to get the digital evidence. Okay, another one, erase computer evidence, meaning the history, what you're doing in the computer, why would you search for something like that? Erase computer evidence. So all of these searches gives us a red flag. Mm, there's something different in his activity in the computer. Okay, so for example, chat. So in here you would see the different chats that he has in, well, let's say for example, Skype. Okay. I might be moving overseas. Okay, I would not put uh, it past him to say, to try to say, I stole stuff. So whatever activity, whatever chat you have, it will be recorded. Okay, so let's say for example, email. So all emails here would be seen. So just imagine, these are datas that are in RAM. If you turn off the computer, all of this data, gone. Okay. So Gmail web uh, Gmail webmail, okay. Your Apple ID was used to sign in to iCloud via web, okay. So it tells you everything. Okay. So aside from that, there are also other files where you can find the remnants of RAM, okay. When say remnants, pieces of RAM, pieces of data in RAM. And why will there be remnants? Well, it depends on what happens to the computer. So remnants of RAM can be found in hyperfilesys, page filesys, and Windows memory dump. So what do you mean by hyperfilesys? Well, if you're an Apple user, okay, normally, or if you, even if you're a Windows user, let's say, for example, you are going to take a snack and you would like to uh, keep private what you're doing, if you close the lid of the laptop, it goes into hibernation. And when that goes into hibernation, all the memory and RAM are placed in hyperfilesys so that when you open the lid, the computer will just extract those files in the hyperfilesys and it would do again, you can do again what you're doing before you close the lid. So it, it will be, so whenever you close the lid, all the data will be there unless you delete it. Okay, so if you in the habit of constantly closing the lid, then you always updated the tape, the file in the hyperfile sys. Now for the page file sys, now let's say for example, if you uh, let's say for example you're doing a lot of things in your computer, you're doing chat, you're doing Facebook, you're doing Twitter, then you are editing a movie. Then you are writing in Word, you're doing some Excel. So therefore, it eats, a lot, eats up a lot of RAM. And if, let's say, for example, your computer has only 4 gig of RAM, and it's almost full, if it is fully full, the RAM, it would hang. So therefore, it will not function properly. So the computer, if it's about to be full, the, the, the space of the RAM, it will throw away the excess, the file at page file sys so that you can continuously have enough RAM to do what you're doing. So whatever files was transferred to the page file sys, it will be there. But then again, it is just a small amount of data. And the third one is Windows memory dump. Now, do you remember the time that when you're using a computer probably 20 years ago when you're in high school and the power went out, brown out, blackout, the computer also shuts down. And when you open the file, what you have been typing, that's it for, for the last 30 minutes and you forget to click save, all of those 30 minutes encoding, gone. Remember the time? Well, starting Windows 7, they come up with a Windows memory dump. Okay? What do you mean by Windows memory dump? Let's say, for example, the power turns off. In that split of a second, it will throw and save data in the Windows memory file. That's why sometimes when you're doing uh, something in your computer, the power turns off. When you open the computer, still you're able to 
what? To retrieve some of what you're doing. Maybe not the entire thing, but some of the data that you have uh, saved when you click save. So that's in Windows Memory Dump. Okay? So all of these three files could have remnants of RAM. But then again, the best data to get RAM is when you image the RAM itself. Okay, word of caution before you proceed with uh, saving RAM or imaging RAM. Okay, now. What are the things that you should remember? Okay, you have to protect the integrity of the digital evidence. It is always imperative because if you blunder the preservation of digital evidence, it might be inadmissible in court. Okay. So, one thing that you should remember is that you do not alter the digital evidence. So, not alter during the imaging, analysis, and custody or the chain of custody. Okay? So, in order to prevent the communication between a storage device and a computer is that you use a write, write block device. Okay? But in imaging RAM, you don't need to use a write block device. Huh? In imaging RAM, you don't need to use a write block device. But I would just like to discuss this. Let's say, for example, you recovered from the suspect in his possession a USB drive. Okay? So you don't just plug this in in a computer because once you plug the device, the USB drive in a computer, the computer and the USB drive will communicate with each other and the computer would make a record that this flash drive was first ins inserted to this computer on this date and the last day it was removed from the computer is on this date. So there is a constant communication. You do not want that communication. So in order to prevent any communication between the computer and a storage device, you need to use a write block device. Okay. So there is a rock block. Uh, there is a write block device for hard drive. So this is the hard drive. You first connect that to the hard write blocker, then the write blocker is connected to the computer. And in this case, you connect the flash drive to the write blocker, and you connect the write blocker to the computer. That's the proper way. Okay. But then again, if you're just going to image RAM, you don't need to use a write blocker. Okay. You may ask, then there would be communication. Well, the communication would be very small, simply because you're just going to copy the image, the RAM. So what is a write blocker? So by definition, a write blocker is any tool that permits read-only access to data storage device without compromising the integrity of the data. So in other words, a write blocker, when used properly, can guarantee the protection of data chain of custody. So it prevents the communication because it is only read-only access. So after you image RAM, okay, you have already created a forensic image of RAM. Okay, then now you're ready to go to step two. Now, what is step two? Okay. So, it's check for encryption. Okay? So, you may ask, what is check for encryption? Well, when you say encryption, it's, it's synonymous to having a password, right? Okay? According to Obicaro, they have experienced that some, some criminals, especially those involved in child pornography, they have the habit of encrypting their computer or they are in the habit of creating an encrypted container in the computer and this encrypted container is password protected and it must be mounted so if you don't mount the encrypted drive you will never know that there is an encrypted drive okay so in order to check whether there is an encryption then you have to use an encrypted disk detector dd so that's why we're going to use this next uh, uh, software edd or the encryption this when you click that just click yes 
you may ask why if this is an open software okay then then just accept you've been doing that in facebook in twitter in instagram so just accept okay so what you would notice is the yellow text enlarge that it says here drive v appears to be a virtual disk possibly a true crypt or a pgp encrypted volume so this tells us that the computer has an encrypted drive okay now we know that the computer has an encrypted drive what are we going to do next okay because we know that there is an encrypted drive what should we do next we image the hard drive okay what hard drive the hard drive of the encrypted container okay so how to capture mounted encrypted drive okay So we do live logical image. So what do we mean by live logical image? So if you would remember again, if you're going to use FTK Imager, you would see this uh, screen. So before we click capture memory, but since we're going to capture the hard drive of the encrypted drive we're going to click create this image okay so you're going to look for this icon so after you click that now you would see that there are several choices we have the physical drive logical drive image file now when you're going to image a flash drive or a hard drive you use physical drive but if you're going to image an, encry an encrypted container you need to use logical drive and if you want if you want to view a forensic image that you created you're going to use image file now for encrypted container we're going to use logical image or logical drive simply because an encrypted container has a password and when you copy that logically it will remove the password so that you can freely examine the image okay let's click next okay Again, huh? you use logical drive, you click next, and you're going to choose which drive do you want to examine. If you would remember, in EDD, it says drive D. So therefore, you have to highlight drive D. Okay? Drive C is your hard drive. So you don't use that. You don't you're going to choose that. Because you're going to copy the virtual drive. You, you click V. Now, the encrypted container has different alphabetical uh distinction or letter it could be f it could be g it could be o it could be x y or z okay but the usual is cnd 
And if you insert a plus drive, it becomes F. So normally, it uses the higher letter of the alphabet. Okay? So you click the virtual drive. Okay? Click Next. Then you're going to click Add. Okay? <clears throat> After you click Add, now it will have this dialog box. You can choose among this RAW, Smart, EO1, or AFF. Now you may ask, what are the difference bit, uh, of these four? Well, RAW... The problem with RAW is that sometimes it can only be read by the software that was used to image it. Okay? Smart is also similar. So that's why we use EO1 according to OBCAR simply because EO1 can be read by any type of forensic uh, device or forensic toolkit, any software that reads forensic image. And at the same time, EO1 has the number, the most number of metadata available. And you may ask, what is metadata? Well, the simple definition of metadata is it, it is an information about the information. For example, if you take a digital picture, it would have metadata. And later on, I will show you what are examples of metadata. So again, we choose EO1. Okay? We always choose EO1. Then we click Next. After that, you will go back to this uh, dialog box where you're going to image V drive. Okay? Then you're going to click Add. Then you're going to see here the case number. So, evidence item information. So, you have to punch uh, uh, type here the case number that your, that your organization uses, the evidence number that you have allotted, you got come up with the unique description and you put here the examiner who is conducting the imaging and notes if you need special notes then after that you click next. okay then it ask you again the image destination folder so you have to click browse okay this is an actual case you're going to save it in the external drive that you have but for this purposes we're just going to save it let's say for example in desktop again under the live response uh, folder We'll make a new folder and let's say it's some called logical V drive. Then, so therefore, now the destination here and the image file name will be logical V drive. Now you click finish. After that, it will come here and you have to check create directory listing of all files in the image after they are created. So this would create a listing, it will tell you all the, the files in the Encrypted drive. If there are 1,700 1, files, it will create a listing, meaning a list of files in that encrypted drive. Okay? So, do always check create directory. Then, you click start. Then, you will see the progress bar and it will tell you it's finished. Then, it will show you this data. And what is this data? Well, it talks about the hash value. Okay, there are two hash values that will be created, MD5 hash and SHA1 hash. MD5 is message digest 5, okay, and SHA1 is secure uh, data, okay. Now, it has a computed hash, okay, and it has a verified result. So, it has a computed hash, a stored verification hash, report hash, then it must all be the same. It will say match, the same with SHA1 hash, okay. So later on, I will discuss more on how what is the importance of having this hash value. But would you, uh, if you're going to ask, are prosecutors, judges familiar with this hash value? Well, I'm very much uh, happy to tell you that the U.S. Department of Justice also conducted this training given to us to judges and prosecutors. As high as the Supreme Court associate, uh, associate justices, they received the same training, so they are now familiar with the hash value. So, in essence, the hash value would be your fail-safe verification that it is authentic. Okay? So, the hash value is a computed uh, numerical arithmetical value of all the content of a certain drive. Okay? So, whatever is the content there, they would mathematically compute an algorithm is created so that they would create a hash value. So, if the content is altered, let's say, for example, you delete a file, you add a file, or in a, in a, full, in a file, let's say, for example, PowerPoint, uh, uh, Word file, 
you delete a period or you add a space in that file, it would change totally the hash value. Okay? So, MD5 hash and SHA1 hash. Later on, at the end of our lecture, we will discuss hash value. So, after that, it will say successfully created, image successfully created. You click, uh, if you want to click image summary, okay? And it will show you this. The case number that you filled up, acquired using uh, the version of the software, and it's FTK. Evidence number, unique description, examiner, and the note. And this is the MD5 hash and the SHA1 hash. Okay? And all the disinformation also. That? So, according to the ACG um, Cybercrime Group, this is the digital forensic process. You identify possible digital device that could have digital evidence. It could be a hard drive, flash drive, memory card, floppy drive, <laughs> CD. Then you acquis the uh, the second process is acquisition or you what we have been discussing imaging. When you image a hard drive, you use a write blocker. When you image a flash drive, you use a write blocker. Okay, so you copy all the files of the hard drive to the folder, an external drive that you have. Then the next process is analysis, where this is conducted in the computer laboratory. They would now use various uh, software uh, tools like, for example, FTK Imager, Encase, Celebrite. So, Encase and FTK are used for computer. Celebrite is used for mobile phone. And luckily, there's no open software for Celebrite. After that, the reporting, meaning the writing of the report or the result of your digital forensic analysis. Then, court presentation to show that the person is did indeed guilty beyond reasonable doubt. Okay, so according to the PNP Cybercrime Group, this is the digital forensic process: identification, acquisition or imaging, analysis, reporting, and court presentation. So as we have mentioned ago, we need to authenticate the image that we created, and like I said, one of the best way to authenticate is coming up with a hash value. There are two hash values. Do you remember the two hash value? We have the NB5 hash and the SHA1 hash. Okay? So what do you mean by this hash? Like I said, the computer will uh, uh, compute all the data in the hard drive. The folders, the browsers that you use, the applications that you have, it will compute that if you're imaging the entire hard drive. If you're imaging a USB drive, it will compute all the content of the flash drive and it will process that in a, mathema a mathematical or algorithm and what will be the result is a number. So if you delete a file, the hash value will change. If you add a file, it would change. Even if you add only a, a comma, a space, remove a letter, a number, it would totally change the hash value. Okay. So therefore, checking the hash value is one of the best way to authenticate the authenticity of the image of a hard drive, a flash drive, or the RAM, or the forensic image. Now you may ask, how, how accurate is the hash value? Well, if you would remember the DNA, it's 100 trillion is to 1. Chances that two persons would have the same DNA. If the court is accepting that number of DNA uh, for the DNA, an MD5 hash or a message digest 5 hash has this number. It has 36 zeros. How do you read this? 340 undecillion times that two hash number would be the same. So if the court is accepting 100 trillion is to 1, how much more is 340 undecillion times? That's 36 zeros and for SHA1 hash it has 48 zeros and how do you read that? 1.4 okay decillion okay so this is undecillion this is uh, quindecillion okay this is undecillion this is 1.4 quindecillion so therefore 
it is impossible that two hash would have this hash value would have the same hash number. So this tells us it is very authentic. Now also I have mentioned that in EO1 it has the most metadata. Now you may ask how to collect metadata. Well, if you would remember, I told you, let's say for example you have a digital picture, it has metadata. So let's analyze metadata from a picture. Now, what forensic tool are we going to use? Well, there's an open software that we use that was given to us by OB Carroll. It is Exit Tool. Okay? So this is the, more, the icon of the Exit Tool. The Exit Tool is a free and open so source software program for reading, writing, and manipulating image, audio, video, PDF, metadata. So it can read the image metadata, audio metadata, video metadata, PDF metadata, and almost any type of file, it has metadata. 